All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Modern Sales Pros Fireside Chat with the one and only Kyle Porter, Sales Loft CEO and founder. I uh, hope everyone is off to a good start of the month. And for those of you on the calendar year uh, quarters, off to a great start to your quarter. We have a lot of, uh, lot of awesome conversations today. Kyle and I had an amazing prep session for this. So in lieu of uh, introducing him, we're going to start jump right in with a little bit about MSP and then have him introduce himself. And then we're going to get live with uh, going through the content for today. For those of you in attendance, please do take note of a few things. First and foremost, do use the Q&A panel. We've got Kyle Porter for almost the entire hour today. So it's a great opportunity to ask him some questions. Secondly, and as part of that, there is an upvote functionality with the Q&A panel. So if somebody asks a great question, go ahead and give that an upvote. It's just like Reddit. Um, so with that, thank you all for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening for today's Modern Sales Pros Fireside Chat with Kyle Porter. Before we jump into it, just a few words about Modern Sales Pros for those of you who are maybe a little bit less familiar. Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest community for revenue leaders in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales enablement, and the related supporting disciplines. The goal of our community is to create an environment where our members can come together, answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own, and learn from some of the best and the brightest. In addition to amazing sessions like what we have here today with Kyle Porter sharing his story, we also do run a very robust online message board. So when you go ahead and ask questions, you get perspectives not just from one or two of your peers or maybe just those in your network, but across the entire continuum of organizations that you see listed here and about 6,000 others. We're about 20,000 members and growing, and we have content and programming like this just about every day of the week. So there's certainly something for you in the community. For those of you who aren't members, you'll be invited to join shortly after our session here today. And today's session certainly wouldn't be possible without sponsorship from the team at SalesLoft. Certainly Kyle's gonna share a whole heck of a lot about SalesLoft, but from a modern sales pros perspective, they're one of our longest term sponsors. I think they were one of the first sponsors of MSP. They do hold a special place as the only four-time sponsor of Modern Sales Pros. So with that, I'm going to invite Kyle Porter, uh, Sales Loft CEO and founder, to join us. And uh, Kyle, are you there? I am. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Excellent. Really, really excited to have you here today. And uh, thanks again for all uh, helping us get the business to where it is today. We really appreciate that. I'll tell you, the first time I saw MSP, I was blown away by the engagement of the community members and fell in love with it from day one. Awesome. It's been, it's been a wild and exciting ride. We've both had a chance to grow quite a bit together. Um, and, and thank you for taking some time out of your day today. I know you're super, super busy running that, that little company sales loft. Before <laughs> we start to talk about kind of the, the founding story and the genesis of sales loft and all of those different um, amazing stories that we have, we'd love to learn a little bit more about Kyle Porter. What's the pre-sales loft story for you? No pressure. Yeah, well, thanks for asking and uh, incredibly glad to be here. I hope everybody who's tuning in or watches this later from video is doing well. Hope you and your families are happy and healthy and thriving as much as you can through this crazy times. But, um, you know, I, I, uh, I've always been uh, pretty entrepreneurial. I had sales, I guess, in my blood from a, from a childhood. I loved, um, I was into selling baseball cards, Beanie Babies. Uh, I think we talked about 1996, the Olympics came to Atlanta. I hopped on my bike, rolled out to Walmart and bought every uh, Olympic lapel pin that I possibly could. <laughs> took it down to Centennial Park and sold it to people from all around the world. And I just loved the look on someone's face when they got something that they wanted or couldn't get their hands on. And, uh, you know, I was hooked from, from an early age. But that led me, of course, down uh, towards wanting to start my own business. And that's a, a fun journey in and of itself. But um, now I'm almost at the nine year anniversary of sales loft, which is crazy. Wow. Um, the products that make us who we are today didn't, weren't, didn't come out till years later, but, um, the early iterations. So yeah, nine year anniversary is this month. Wow. wow. That's, a, that's Happy amazing. Birthday. Yeah. Thank congratulations you. on that. Zoom kind of <laughs> hides it, but the, um, the ARR growth chart is the equivalent of the gray hair growth chart for me. 
Um, but I think it's <laughs> nice. well, I got a special light here, you know, at, at least, at least you've got it. Some of us uh, like Pete and I are a little bit less fortunate. We, we lost it long before we got to make the nine year run. <laughs> Uh, but Kyle, let's let's jump into it a little bit. I think uh, you know Sales Loft, very very well known in the in the modern sales pros community. Obviously, you're you're well known as an entrepreneur, but it's it's ubiquitous. I mean, the Forrester wave, you're dominant in G two. It's well known everywhere today. But how did it how did things get started for you at Sales Loft? And I know there are some interesting pivots that you've had in sort of Sales Loft V one and all that. But how did things get going for you? Yeah, well, you know, while I mentioned that I was, you know, a lover of the art and science of sales, you know, at an early age, I actually knew that I was going to start a company and didn't know that it was going to be in sales software. So I had, uh, I had a, a pretty kind of rare childhood and, and you know, grew up and I, I kind of grew up fast, right, uh, during the end of my college years. And I came to this conclusion that I had, just like you and everyone else that's attending here, had been given a lot of talents and skills and capabilities. And I had been squandering a lot of mine, you know, up into my college <laughs> years. Um, but I made the commitment that I was going to use those to serve others and make the world a better place. And then I found myself in, uh, organizing an entrepreneurship club in Atlanta. And I remember looking around the room and seeing these incredible people from all different walks of life with all these unique characteristics, talents, and skills and feeling like I could do something to help them thrive. I could do something, I could create a company as a vehicle to help them grow, to learn more, to do more, to become more. So I set up the idea that I was gonna start a company um, not knowing what it was going to be. And there was this guy in Atlanta named David Cummings. Some of you might know him. He was the founder and CEO of Pardot, which is now salesforce.com's marketing automation product. And I saw David through kind of the local startup community. And there were a few things that really stood out about him. Uh, David had this uh, real keen sense to focusing on the culture of an organization. And I really loved the attitude that he had about how you should treat people, how you should treat your staff and the love of the customer. And so I knew I wanted to start a company. Then I knew I wanted to start it with him. And so we came together and we decided uh, through a series of, um, of uh, brainstorming and investigation that we do it in sales software. So that's kind of how that all happened. But then when you looked at sales, you know, I had been doing it my whole life and I thought I had really differentiated in that I was very keen to understand the needs of my buyer, um, to connect with them in an authentic and sincere way, uh, to really kind of, you know, move the other direction from what you see the negative connotations of the sales profession sometimes. And I was really into this deeply sincere and authentic selling, but the difficulty was making it scale. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had optimized for the relationship and the experience more than the process and the scalability. But I had also had some cool experiences in previous jobs where I had done a good job there as well. And I thought, hey, let's put these two things together. Customers demand an incredible sales experience that's unique to them, that solves their problems. Um, and then companies, operators, and their owners and investors and executives, we want scalable, predictable. We want to be able to forecast it invest and know what we're going to get in return. I said, let's bring those two things together so that we can deliver the customer with an incredible sales experience, but do it thousands of times over and over again. So that really led the path down to creating sales loft with the vision that we see a world where one day sellers are loved, all sellers are loved by the buyers they serve. And that's where it all kicked off. And was it now, I know in the, in the early days, there were some, some different product lines that were maybe profitable, but didn't fulfill that, that sort of authentic brand promise. And I think you took the, the unique step of killing maybe some of those offered de-investing in them. Man, I mean, I mentioned nine years running with the company and it's only been five years since the Cadence product was launched. So there were four years of just iteration, right? And we built all kinds of things. Um, I <laughs> built a, the first version of Sales Loft was look at all of your open opportunities, go out on the web, find out what jobs they're posting, find out their tweets, um, find out news articles about them and pull them into the CRM. That was the very, very first uh, version. The second version was, we're gonna look at all your uh, closed one customers and try to mine out this like 20 point DNA inspection of these customers so we can go out and find you a bunch of potential customers. Mm. Um, then we created, then we got a little traction on this idea of like bringing news on opportunities to, to reps. And I thought, okay, well, you know, the old days, like someone would wake up and like open up a newspaper, right? And like, look at the news right. of the day. And now people are going online and maybe it's Twitter or maybe it's LinkedIn or, you know, news sites or RSS feeds. I said, let's create an RSS feed for the accounts that you're connected to in your CRM and then right. deliver that to you on a daily basis. So as a rep, you just wake up and you go, 
oh, I'm selling to these 30 companies. Here's all the things that happened with them. Yeah, just, you know, you got a stream you can look through and it would do cool things like pull in the people at those accounts that you have connected with. And if you click their name, it would auto populate an email to them with the article link and like fill out their name and like start the ball rolling towards this like sincere connection with them. All that stuff you're supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, and it, but it was like, it was all really cool, but it really wasn't moving the needle for customers. <laughs> and we started like, you know, we were over sophisticated. And what we found was that these customers, what they really wanted when we got real close with them is they wanted the names of the contacts that they could reach out to. <laughs> and so Weird. We, we had actually created this. Um, they just wanted phone numbers, emails, and names and titles in companies. And um, so we had built this like internal product that we were using to, um, to sell to our customers. And it was basically just like scraping LinkedIn. I can say that now because we no longer do it. There's others out there that still do it. They, they <laughs> capture the information on the open web, you know? And, um, but it was like a pretty good LinkedIn scraper, the best. <laughs> and, um, and then it just, you know, we said, well, what if we make this available to others? What would happen? And then we still never thought it was a core product and it just started taking off. And I remember there was a day, it was all free. And I remember there was a day where just like our servers got hammered and this thing just like, just got destroyed from, you know, a bunch of international countries and we're like maybe there's something here and so we started surveying everybody and they go well if you can give me the the actual email address and the phone number then this will be awesome so we we started to get into the contact data game and i guess at that point in time it was like data.com uh the old ranking discover org zoom info you know all those players and um and that was a fun little run because we were empowering our customers to be able to capture the most accurate and up-to-date contact lists for their accounts um, and what we thought that would mean is if you get these lists and then they're more easy to capture, then it can free you up to do more creative labor in your sales efforts. So you can, you know, be more authentic. You can think more about who the customer is. You don't have to spend any time like capturing those names. Um, but people really took advantage of it in some ways that we didn't love. They would build these giant lists and lump them into their marketing automation spam blasters, like, you know, like <laughs> pour them in and like turn the grinder and like, you know, spit out these messages and it really disgusted me and it didn't align with the values of the business. And so, but it was meanwhile generating a lot of revenue. It was, I think at some point in time when we raised our series A, that was a three and a half million dollar ARR product. Wow. And it was growing at a hundred percent. It had grown at like 400% the year before, but it was still growing above a hundred percent. And, um, and we had created, you know, watching great reps, we created what is now our, you know, core platform. And that was like a hundred K. So we raised a series A with a hundred K run rate on cadence, you know, just shy of 4 million on the old product. But the whole story was we're investing all in this new stuff. So that's really what happened in kind of abbreviated version. That's, I mean, that's, that's crazy. And it's such a, it's such a Delta from that, who you, who you're sort of aspiring to be with this authentic relationship and how people were actually using the data product. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about sales loft. And I think, you guys are growing very quickly. How, how big is sales loft now? So we are above 450 employees, probably just shy of five, 475 is the probably plus or minus five right now. I just did an onboarding <laughs> class with 15 new people. So um, yeah, and uh, we've got 3000 customers. We've raised 145 million. Uh, we've got offices or we used to have offices um, in New York, London, San Francisco, Guadalajara, <laughs> Indianapolis and Atlanta. Um, and uh, yeah, we did an acquisition of a conversation intelligence product two years ago, and they had a big team down there, oh. um, which is great, by the way. They're incredible entrepreneur, or incredible um, engineers with an entrepreneurial right. mindset and uh, love what we're doing. And it's been a great partnership. But yeah, so it's, it's, I guess it's a bigger company than it was before, and it's grown pretty rapidly. No, that's, I think that's, that's phenomenal. And it's interesting too. We'll talk a little bit about the acquisitions in a bit, but you, you pride yourself. And I know sales off prides itself quite a bit on building a strong organizational culture. You mentioned some of the early conversations that you had had with, um, that you had with David around building culture and culture first. Has it always been that way for you from the beginning at sales off? Was it always like, we're going to build great culture and then product and all that? Or was there a period of time where you just paid it lip service? You know, uh, it's, it's a really good question. I, uh, I had this really, I had this privilege of having a mentor, a guy named Charles Brewer. He was the founder of an ISP in Atlanta years ago called Mindspring. You might've heard the company Earthlink. He later became chairman of the board there when they acquired his company. 
Yep. And, um, and he had this, um, the CV and B's core values and beliefs. And I remember they were on Wikipedia and uh, it was how he ran his business. And I remember being so inspired by this and it was, it really had aligned with my upbringing and some of the things that I valued in life. And it was just different than just making money or, you know, building things and selling things. And it was really about the people and how do you treat them and how do you build a, a legacy for, you know, something special. And that was really inspirational to me. And the same thing with David Cummings. David said as a founder and a CEO that the, the only thing that you have complete control over is the company culture, that the markets can shift and change. We know that, you know, the macroeconomic climate can be upended overnight. <laughs> there's political, you know, there's all these things that kind of happen out there. And there's this idea of like, you get this circle of concern and then you've got the circle of influence. It's a um, <laughs> old, I think that's a good to great Jim Collins or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I thought I really bought into that and then I applied it. I thought I applied it and I applied it weekly in the first year of the company, because basically I still let people on board that I didn't see eye to eye on and how you should treat others and what value should be. Um, and I wasn't that good at it either. I was a terrible leader the first year and, you know, tried to improve ever since then. Uh, but yeah, I think it's always been the thing that's important to me. There's this funny interview question that I really like, and I don't know if any of you want to try it. Um, but the question is, what is something that you hold to be true that many others would disagree with? Right. And that's a deep question, right? Because you're really getting at the core of like, yeah. you know, what differentiates you? And for me, you know, I don't hear this often. Maybe, you know, maybe you're swimming in different circles. But to me, organizational health is the biggest sustainable differentiating advantage a company can have, period. You know, next sentence, next paragraph, right? Like yeah. that, that, that is it at its core. <laughs> And what that means to me is that you have alignment on what's the vision of this company. And that vision is one step short of solving the world's problems. What's the mission? How are you, you know, going after attaining that vision? And what are the set of behaviors that you hold near and dear to the organization that you screen for deeply on interviews, that you coach on regularly, and that you make a critical part of your business? And, you know, I think, you know, maybe it's um, survivorship bias, but it's done us very well. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've really focused on how do we love our employees so that they can then turn around and love on our customers and it's worked out. And I, I really believe in it. No, I think that's, I mean, that's phenomenal perspective. And you hear, you hear organizations talk about culture, 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 but you're, you're really living it. Uh, you've, and, and you mentioned this before you acquired a few different companies with such a strong organizational, uh, culture. How do you, how do you onboard new organizations into that mix is it do you have to have that pattern match with culture before you acquire or how does that work yeah of course not you know i've never done m a for a large company i've never done m a prior to sales loft so we're kind of just doing it our, our <laughs> way but i assume <laughs> that large companies when they're evaluating acquisitions that one of those buckets is a culture bucket actually i remember when colin powell's email got hacked and uh the salesforce board of directors documents were leaked and they had the code names for the acquisitions that they were evaluating. Did anyone ever see, did you see this? I don't remember, that. I don't remember that. Yeah, it's really cool. I think Colin Powell's email got hacked um, and confidential documents on the, on the acquisitions they were looking at got leaked. And one of the columns of evaluating each and every one of the, and Tableau was one of the big ones that they were evaluating at the time. But one of the columns <laughs> was the um, Glassdoor score for each of those companies. Mm, yeah. And it was like one of six columns. So it wasn't like one of 32. It was like one sure. of six primary factors to help determine whether or not this would be a good fit for at the, you know, for Salesforce in, in that example. And so for us, I think it's probably like one of three, you know, and it's, <clears throat> it's always been one because no, none of the acquisitions we've made have ever surfaced to the acquisition, you know, to evaluation prior to having seen the alignment on the organizational health front. Right. So I think right. that is a big one and something that we've taken into account. And then of course there's like, you know, kind of the indoctrination stuff. But a lot of times, you know, when you, when you've got someone that like our core values are not, they're things that many people in their lives hold to be important. And if you're one of those people that hold these values to be important, then there's a high likelihood that you'll be a cultural fit here. Um, and so that's really it. So it's like, you know, if those things are important to the founders, then they've probably been operating that way anyways. They just might not have codified it the same way we have. No, that's, I think that's an interesting point. And I want to, I want to change gears just a little bit here because you have grown quite a bit. You've brought on uh, the executive ranks have grown a lot. How do you, as a leader and how do you hold your leadership team accountable for making sure the culture is awesome or authentic? I should say. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it starts with, it's like the whole, you probably heard this a bunch of times. If you got a kid, you have to say things like 37 times for them to, you know, for it to soak in. Like, <laughs> or, or if you manage a sales team. Only? Gentle hands. Yeah. Like every day, you know, 37 times a day or a week or whatever. Um, and I think that's an important one. And, and I don't want to sound like I'm the parent and they're the kids because I'm actually the parent to myself too. Right. Mm -hmm. So the more times I talk about the core values, um, one of them is glass half full as an example. The more times I say the words glass half full, the more times I screen for it in a candidate, the more times I give an example of someone living those values at an all hands or on a weekend update, the more times I praise a direct employee or, you know, report on, then the more times I catch myself when I'm about to do it wrong. Right. So I'm actually <laughs> policing myself and uh, a, a great mentor, an incredible guy. He once told me, he said, a really good leader makes a mistake and then quickly realizes he made a mistake or she made a mistake and fixes it. But a great leader realizes when they're about to make a mistake and fixes it before mm. they make it. And that's how it is for me. It's like now when a situation comes up and I'm glass half empty, I'm like glass half empty in my head for a second. And then I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that. And that's not the way. <laughs> right. And so I self police myself, if you will. And I think that's really, it's that whole like repetition and indoctrination. I mean, there's for everyone who joins sales loft, you have to go through, um, a culture check interview. The culture check interview is uh, um, co-ed. There's like 17 teams of two people each and each mm. team is co-ed and from different functions of the organization. Mm. And they're people that have exhibited the core values of sales loft that, you know, have them kind of hold them high in their heart and mind. And then they've got questions for every value and they're trained on what to look for and how to follow up on those questions. So it starts very first at the you know, absolute beginning. And then it's like the praises, the coaching, um, awards, recognition, uh, you know, stories, just examples after examples. I think that's, it's, it's phenomenal to hear really how that kind of takes precedent in, in your mind. And you're even, like you said, parenting yourself on this. One of, one of the things that's interesting too, and SalesLoft has been a great partner to MSP and to women in sales and to Europe and other organizations sort of advancing issues of diversity and uh, inclusion. And I know that's an important part as well of the, the SalesLoft onboarding. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that plays into a lot of these decisions yeah, sure and discussions? Thing. It's absolutely critical, of course, that you know, we want our people, our lofters to represent our customers and our community. And we want to have, you know, in, we want to have ang uh, in, insights and influence from all different angles of backgrounds and experiences. And we also want to share those experiences transparently and vulnerably with each other so that when we tackle these big issues, when we have these, um, you know, productive conflict sessions that we understand kind of the background and experience of someone. You might have someone that is in finance and grew up very poor and they're holding tight to the money and you want to know like why they're the way, you know, that, that helps to kind of go through those conversations. Or like me, I grew up with, you know, a rare blood disease and wasn't expected to live past infancy. It's crazy story of childhood sickness, but I was fighting all the time. Right. And so I kind of get into these, you know, I fight a lot and um, but it's helpful for me to be able to share my story in a way where people understand that's kind of, you know, those are some of the things that were ingrained in me. That doesn't have to make me who I am. I can work through that, of course. Um, but sometimes it, you know, it shows its way, in, you know, and I think that's really important is understanding where we come from, what makes us different and unique, you know, what our backgrounds are, but sales Loft has a long way to go. I am not satisfied or happy with our executive leadership team diversity. I'm not satisfied or happy with our board of directors diversity. Um, I believe we're doing a really good job with the rest of the organization, but that's not enough. And so we got work to do and I can't um, stand up and say that's an area where we're an A plus by any means. And I think it's, it's, I mean, it's an important area as well for the MSP community and for leadership in general. So I appreciate your, your transparency on that and recognizing that we all have a long way to go uh, to, to solve a lot of these issues. And I think for sales loft, especially, you've got a unique perspective on a few different aspects of building and scaling a high growth business. You, you're, most folks know this, uh, sales loft headquartered in, in Atlanta. Uh, and then, like you said, you have kind of offices everywhere around the, the world or did. Um, well, I'd love just a little bit on that, Kyle. I loved how Sales Loft would expand and add and kind of instantiate new offices in the pre-pandemic. Can you chat a little bit about the effect of like sort of exporting culture from Atlanta to those organizations, the, the sort of the field offices that you set up? Yeah, sure. I mean, Atlanta has been fantastic for us. I, I, uh, I grew up in Atlanta, went to school in Atlanta. Um, actually, the first year of sales off, we moved out to Boulder, Colorado, and went through the Techstars program. So that was 
you know, we did spend a lot of time in, out in Boulder, but, um, and oh. in Boulder, there were investors that said, move to the West coast, move to New York. And <laughs> even ones that moved to Boston, and I love all those cities and I've had the opportunity to travel the world, but Atlanta's, you know, home and it's, it's a great city for sales loft. And Atlanta has a great fortune 500 population. It's really strong on the enterprise sales and marketing. Um, there's been some great stories. MailChimp is an Atlanta company. Um, Pardot was obviously an Atlanta company. Um, in some of the early, early, like MSA uh, was a, a big sales organization that no one's probably heard about because it was like the 80s. Um, but there's just been some great businesses in Atlanta that have bred awesome go-to-market talent and, uh, and mindshare. And, um, and then it, you can travel anywhere. It's just great. And then the schools are fantastic. The diversity is awesome. And so Atlanta has been a great place for us. Um, when we've moved to new locations, what we've done is we've said, okay, well, we want to hire locally so that we get the local experience kind of mixed into our culture there. But we also want to send out a lofter or two or three in some cases. And, uh, and that's usually someone that might've come from that, those co-ed culture check interview teams that really represents who we are. And so we've sent lofters to, to London, to New York, to San Francisco, I don't think we've sent any permanently down to Guadalajara yet, but I'm sure there's a few that are interested. Um, and, uh, and it's been great just to kind of bring the culture of the company, but not give up the culture of the company as you adopt a new regional culture. No, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting point, right? I remember when you opened the, um, the EMEA office, there was a few folks that went from Atlanta out there and then you'd hired some local expertise. How, well, EMEA's how been great those... for us. You know, the Forrester yeah. Wave just launched and um, it measured all of sales engagement and one of the factors that it ranks is market presence. And mm. so it gives you a score of one to five on market presence. And that determines how big your bubble is, right? Mm. And SalesLoft is the only company in that wave, the Forrester wave, that has a five of five market presence. So we have the biggest bubble there. And uh, when I, I didn't know why, you know, I didn't know what was market share or customers or revenue. I didn't know what the characteristics were. And those were taken into account. But the thing that put us over the edge was actually our um, international presence. And the, the team that we had established in London and EMEA and the customer base that we had already generated and kind of getting first to international expansion was um, a big factor in Forrester ranking us as the highest market presence in the category, which is really cool to see. Yeah, no, that's, that's, ex that's exciting stuff. And I think that's an area where organizations scale and maybe don't know. So that perspective is great of kind of export a little bit hire a little bit for local expertise and put the kind of get the best of both. Well, there's a there. bunch of, there's a bunch of fantastic thought leadership out there on how to do that. And so we just soaked it up. Like there's investors in London that want to invest in your company in the US. And so they'll help you on how to get out there. And so we, we did a lot of that. And then I remember I did a, um, a dinner once and it was um, just like CEOs of US-based SaaS companies with their um, EMEA head uh, counterparts. And I went to this whole mm -hmm. dinner and it, I mean, it was just so valuable to go through that. That was during like a SaaS stock event or something like that. Fun, fun stuff. So one question, because we're, we're on EMEA and this is a little bit off script, but I'm, I'm curious, what, what made you choose London versus sometimes you hear Amsterdam or Berlin as, a, as an EMEA base? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, it wasn't my decision. Uh, it, I wasn't against it, but we had a team that, you know, put a matrix scorecard out and put all the characteristics of which they wanted to evaluate and ran a lot of analysis and then rolled with it. Um, but I think it was, uh, it was, it, it was the talent access it was the fact that there are a lot of customers in region that we could get to physically. Um, we have a good uh, uh, we have a, a good financial services and fintech practice in terms of our customer base, and London's great for financials. So those are some of the factors. Oh, that makes that makes sense. Data driven decision. Why would I be surprised by that? <laughs> uh, so changing gears here just a little bit. Being an Atlanta based company, you talked about kind of going to tech stars in Colorado, thinking about Boston, thinking about San Francisco. How were those early fundraising efforts being an Atlanta-based company? Do you feel like you were playing from behind a little bit? Yeah, you know, so I guess we did it a little bit unique. You know, David Cummings, the guy I mentioned who is the CEO and founder of Pardot, he and I really started the business together in his offices of Pardot. Mm -hmm. And we didn't raise another dime until after we were well into the, you know, past the million dollar ARR mark. So it was really, he kind of was funding the business, but we weren't using a bunch of money. I mean, we probably burned through like, 250, 300K max. Um, and then we started paying, I started paying that back to him. So I was like paying him back for the loans that he had. So we kind of got, you know, the fact that that first product took off so rapidly, we were, we weren't bootstrapped because if it wasn't for David's money, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, off the ground. <laughs> uh, but we had no institutional or other, we had no other investors at all. 
-hmm. And, um, and so that made it a little easier that we didn't need those investors to get to that stage. And then there was one guy in Atlanta named Tom Noonan that basically everybody looks up to as the ultimate entrepreneur and investor in the city. Um, the kind of the biggest hit that he had was he, he sold IB, uh, I, internet security systems to IBM for like two and a half billion after taking it public. And um, I think he took it public in Japan and then sold it to IBM. And he had made like a bunch of home run investments after that. So we wanted him on board because he was awesome. And he was just the guy I really looked up to. So I stalked him until we got him to do an investment. And <laughs> he invested, um, we did a whiteboard session on Cadence. And it had been, you know, we whiteboarded a bunch of times. We hadn't built anything. And so I just drew out what the future of, of sales was going to be. And he fell in love with it. And so he gave us some cash and then we launched it. And then we went out to the West Coast to raise our Series A. Interesting. It's a cool, it's a really interesting story, right? Atlanta company. How do you, how do you go through it? On, on, the, on the fundraising front, how do you think the pandemic is going to change things or will it change things? Do you think there'll be more companies headquartered kind of wherever, or do you still think it's going to congregate on the, on the coast? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I think prior to COVID, you'd see a lot of Bay Area companies <clears throat> and they would almost brag about the number of employees they had that weren't in San Francisco. <laughs> right. Like I, mean, I talked to a bunch of sales leaders and it's like, well, where's your inside sales office? And they, you know, everyone would brag about how many reps they had that weren't in the Bay area. So I think <laughs> that's kind of happening already, um, you know, with like Denver and Utah and Atlanta, uh, Austin is a great city. And so there's a lot of that going on, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, this is changing a bunch of stuff. The, the wild thing to me is, is like, you know, okay, unprecedented, never been seen before. Of course, all those things are true. But when you look at the effects on sales and it kind of accelerating this digital sales movement, those things were already all in the works, right? Yeah. We kind of yeah. thought this day was coming in a way, maybe we thought it was going to be, you know, down the road a lot longer. But these trends, right. are, I, mean, like, I think it's like a, there's an old insidesales.com Forbes study. I think it's like 2017 or 18. And it states that, inside sales was growing at 15 X the rate of field. Yep. Right. So this stuff's kind of already happening. Um, but it's definitely accelerated. No, I think, and that's a good, that's a good segue into, you know, you whiteboarded this out once before, before you even had a, a product, but let's, let's kind of talk about the future of sales. And I'm going to break this up into two pieces. Forget the tech for a second. What, what's the future of a revenue organization? Where, where are we going in the next five or 10 years? What do you think? Yeah, well, I'll go back to the beginning and kind of state what that first vision was and then show how that's stayed the same in a lot of ways, but also changed. And the whole idea originally was like, there's all these customers out there and they want to solve their problems, period, right? That's the only thing they care about. They don't give shit about, sorry, your, <laughs> how many fields you have mapped in your sales force, right? Like they don't care about your process. They don't care about your sales cycle. They don't care about, they don't care about anything other than solving their problems. And what they need is someone who could come in and understand those problems, provide them with a solution and make it happen, period. That needs to be one-to-one -to, -one to them. It needs to be unique. It needs to be empathetic. It needs to be non-selfish to the rep and what their goals or their process or achievements are. Um, that's what the buyer needs and demands. And quite frankly, deserves, right? We, they deserve to get that from us. Then on our side and, you know, revenue operators, CROs, founders, investors, whoever, like they go to board meetings, they want predictable, they want to know what we're going to achieve. They want to know, okay, we can invest X and return Y and here's how we're going to do it. And it's spreadsheet business, you know, mm -hmm. but those two things just really bump up against each other because if you operate just off the mentality of scalable, you know, you know, just that, that attitude, it kind of leads you into this path of communicating a way the customer doesn't really want to be communicated with. So those two things have to align and meet up. And that's why sales engagement exists in the first place to give a company a place because the CRM is not doing it. It's a database. Give mm -hmm. this you know, communication layer that sits on top of the CRM and it allows you to codify that best in practice, go to market. It's going to deliver that customer an incredible sales experience, but then it allows you to repeat it over and over again. It allows you to hold the reps accountable to the actions they're taking on it. It allows you to mine out the insights to improve that process so that you can move along. Right. And so I think that's a big, big component of it that hasn't, it's not like we've snapped our fingers and that's been solved. Right. Um, sales engagement is funny. Like you see all these great SaaS companies with these multi-billion dollar market caps or, you know, giant market caps. And um, a lot of them are just repeats of what they're, you know, off out of the cloud in on-premise old software companies were doing. Right. right? Like salesforce.com didn't invent the CRM. Right. right. Zoom didn't invent the telecommunication, you know, the teleconference. 
but sales engagement was invented by, we invented this category. You guys helped invent this category, right? MSP is part of the invention and bringing to life of sales engagement and it never existed before. So you look out to the world and there's all these companies, they don't have, there's no 10 year veterans of sales engagement, right? right. <laughs> and sales engagement requires, and not just sales engagement, sales enablement, conversation intelligence, you know, pipeline and forecasting apps. Like these things require an amazing amount of, change management, integrations, configurations, um, coaching, like best practices, training, and yeah. companies don't know how to do all these things on their own. Now you start stacking them, right? I think one of your, like you have that picture of all of your customers or the members of Topo, but it kind of reminds me of that sales landscape, whatever oh, yeah. picture with all the different apps. Like now right. you, let's say you've got conversation intelligence, deal management, sales engagement, a dialer, you got these four apps and they all want to integrate with the CRM. They all want to integrate with the email. They all want to integrate with your calendar. They all want to configure your fields. They want to want to call on the API, right? It's <laughs> complicated. So I think removing all these complications is really important for companies so they can set their digital sales organizations up to succeed. And the future, in my opinion, is that these alpha platforms will emerge that will roll up a lot of these technologies and allow a company, not just the product to solve the problem, but also the, the service side the coaching, the setup, the integration, the best practices, um, because that stuff's super important. Um, so there's a lot of that. And then, you know, we can get into a whole discussion about data and the power of leveraging this information. And, um, you know, we start talking down the tracks of AI and machine learning, and there's just unlimited potential there and really cool things that are being done today. I think, I think that's a great point. We had on the, the CRO of Terminus a couple of weeks ago and his background, and we know each other from the B2C MarTech world. And it's funny because in that world, you've got 70,000 different tools and an average B2C marketers tool set. It's, it's obscene how many they are. We're starting <laughs> to see that trickle in into sales, right? You mentioned six or seven categories that didn't exist six or seven years ago. So from your perspective, you mentioned AI, you mentioned ML. What's most exciting for you about the next five years on the technology side? What are you like, mm, I'm really excited about this. And that can be a something sales loft is doing or something that you're just personally interested and fired up about? Yeah. You know, I think right now there is um, so much value being recognized out in the world for um, the conversation intelligence type solutions that are in the marketplace. And uh, we were really fortunate. So you go back two years, two years ago, we had one of our Rainmaker conferences and we do sponsors and booths and, you know, all that. And, um, and we have an integration you know, application program where partners come and integrate the sales off. And that year, five companies in, in conversation intelligence had built an integration, sponsored the conference and showed up with a booth. And I remember being like, you know, this is starting to take off and there's something special here. And we loved it and used it on our own side. And so we ended up making an acquisition in that category. And now we roll out a conversation intelligence offering as part of sales loft. And when you look at, especially today with all this remote workforce and you know, everybody's on Zooms and, and meetings like this. And <laughs> there's no voice more important to your company than the voice of the customer. Right. And that voice has been getting stepped on and truncated and summarized manually or not. And sometimes added to the CRM and not easy to read. I mean, you go in and you see an opportunity and like, where is this thing? And it's like 60 words, but yet you've got the actual conversation of the customers telling you where it is and you can mine out the value from there. And and that's just an example of kind of this idea that we're collectively capturing lots of data, but we're not really massing the requisite insight to go along with that today. And I think that's really where the future of, of digital sales and, and um, you know, and sales engagement or, you know, all the kind of, you know, categories that make that up are live. I think that, and that's something too, where we, we talk about that a lot in MSP and it's like, how do you, how do, which, which one is better, right? Is it this call recording software or that call record? And then someone will always come along and say, well, hold on, how are you going to use it? Is it just yeah. going to be another thing that goes and dies in the, in the CRM? Or are you going to actually like cut out bits and send that to the product team or the product marketing team? I think that that's exciting. The other part that we see too is the evolution of sort of platform connectors. There's a whole generation of products that are in the early stage right now that help kind of connect all these different systems and get them all into, because it's all going to go to the CRM anyways. But it's just funny that we've come so far in five years where we are like, what's a cadence to, oh my goodness, I've got all of these tools. How do I get that all into a cadence, which is exciting. 
Yeah, I mean, there's 75, we have 75 plus integration partners that have built out you no know, connectors to sales loft. And um, yeah, so it's wild. It's, it's, it's exciting. It can't stop. I mean, that number is <laughs> thousands, right? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's, that's exciting too. And we're going to, Kyle, we're going to move into some Q's and A's that came in during, uh, during registration for folks that are live now. We've had Kyle running here for a bit. Feel free to hop in the Q&A panel and submit any questions that you have. And we'll, we'll kind of take those as they come. One of the first questions, and this came up a few times during registration, Kyle, successful entrepreneurs and folks like yourself, um, it's really difficult to maintain balance, stay healthy, stay centered. How do you do it? How do, you, how do you keep your head on and stay in a positive space so you can check yourself and say, hey, hold on, I'm glass half empty right now. I got to get back to glass half full to be the man I need to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, it's, it's tough to, you know, put me as authority on that. I'm happy to just share my example. <laughs> well, what works for you? Um, yeah, knowing yeah, it'll be yeah, different yeah. for It everybody. doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll share that too. Uh, so, you know, for starters, really, um, I just... Uh, I love, 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 love to read. And I adopted this mentality at an early age of being a lifelong learner. And for some reason, it's just always stuck that, you know, you're never, there's, there's no negative labels that I'll ever provide myself ever. There's only positive labels, right? There's this idea of like, what got you here won't get you there. There's this book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And there's one that says, um, one of the things that holds you back is an excessive need to be me. You might say something like, oh, you know, I was late for a meeting again. Oh, that's just me. I'm late, right? So I find this out in the world very often that people give themselves these labels that are negative. And I just decided early on to never, ever give myself a label that's negative, period. Um, if I'm going to give any labels, they're going to be kind, caring, compassionate, empathetic, you know, things that I want to espouse to, right? So those are the only labels I'll give myself. And I just read a ton and it helps me be, um, I guess, self-aware, but um, and then when I read, I like to action off of it, not just like read and toss it away. So like put it to work. Um, but, you know, personally, I, um, I guess ever since COVID, I've been, we moved down to our tangerine farm in central Florida, which has been a definite change of pace from living in the city in Atlanta. Um, you know, haven't been on a plane since, I guess I've been on a plane once since February. Um, but that really helps. And then, you know, just spending quality time with the kids. I think there was this, um, I guess it was like five habits maybe it's from five habits book and the, the dad comes home from work and he pulls in the driveway and he just hits this massive pause button, takes this deep breath and puts everything else aside, runs into the house and yells out something like, you know, daddy's home. Try not too hard to run at me too fast, you know, and just like switches into this mode where that's like all in, you know? And so I do that as much as I can, you know, with my wife and with my kids and, it's just really rewarding to invest in them and kind of turn off the outside world. But I think you just need systems and processes. And I used to be a big kind of, you know, set a bunch of goals and track towards them really hard. Now I just set up like rules and processes and just follow those. And um, it's been great. That, that's more of the, that's more of the atomic habits model, right? Like don't, don't necessarily worry about the outcome, but do the right things in place to get to where you want to get to. And each little change you make will put you closer and closer to the pin there. So in terms of, I want to, I want to kind of come back now a little bit to the, to the company. There was a bunch of questions that come in and we get these all the time when we have somebody like you on zero to 5 million in ARR is a big old pain in the butt. A lot of organizations don't ever cross that threshold. Some would argue it's actually the hardest challenge to face in all of company building. I, I, I'd love your perspective. If you could reflect back on the community that run when you were going from zero to around 5 million in ARR, if you could do it again, what would you do differently? And if you could provide any advice to our aspiring entrepreneurs in the community, what would it, what would it be around <laughs> that, that portion of the run? No pressure, yeah. Kyle, just give the entire MBA <laughs> class in five minutes. Please. <laughs> well, I can just speak to my experiences. You know, I will, I will share a story. I remember with our first product, when it hit, when it was at 998,000 ARR, I remember, um, I, I went on this walk with my co-founder and I remember we, I just was, I was stressed that we would never get there. Like we had, I mean, we had predictably <laughs> scaled to the 998, right? But for some reason there was this like fear and like this, um, you know, paranoia that they just never was going to get there. And of course it hit it, it hit a million and it like someone churned and it went back down to 999 or something. <laughs> it was so bad, you know, it was so heart wrenching. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, well, personally, what I would do is with the, you know, cadence when we launched that, I would have dumped the other product way earlier if I knew, if I had the foresight of what this category and market was going to be. I mean, I thought it was going to be special and I just never really could understand how big it could get. And then also knowing, I mean, this is all Monday morning quarterback stuff. Also knowing how big and how fast it would grow and adopt, <laughs> I would have invested more and spent more, you know, I just would have stepped on the gas a little bit more um, to earn more market share and to, you know, kind of supplant us in the, in the, in the, in the category better. Um, so those are kind of some of the things, but uh, you know, the, the real important ones are getting crystal clear about the charter of your business. And I kind of always thought I was crystal clear about the vision, mission, and values, but they got smarter. Every, they got better every time I did a deep dive into them. And it's almost like this attitude that like, today I tell you how important organizational health and culture is. Tomorrow I will recognize it as more important than I know it to be today. Mm -hmm. And that's been the history through the whole entire journey. And uh, it's kind of like, I only understand it to a point right now, but tomorrow I'll understand it better. And it will be more important to me then when I understand it better. And so that's one that kind of, you can't underinvest there. But I think there's a, there is a, a trade-off. It's like, if the company wasn't successful, like if the product market fit never happened, then all that investment in the culture would have not been necessary or worth it. You know, like, but maybe it helped yeah. us get product market fit. I don't know. But like, right. there's a little bit of that, like, do you invest so deeply in the things that only matter if you make it? Well, does it, does it set you all up to be better positioned to pivot, right? When you're talking about right. kind of hiring and when you were talking about being in the, in the entrepreneurship club back in the early days, you're surrounded by smart people and you're like, I'm going to start a company. It wasn't a industry leading sales engagement tool that defined the term and built the category. It wasn't a 500 person ish organization with offices in what, 12 or, or 15 different cities. And I think that that's the part, that's what I've taken away from this in some way, shape or form that hire and kind of surround yourself by the right people. And that, that probably gives you more agility to pivot. So if, yeah. if Cadence didn't get product market fit, if uh, the data product was the, the horse that you decide or something else, right? Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. having those smart people because you invested in that versus, well, we're going to work with Rich because he's the best with this database technology that's only relevant if we do this exact narrow thing. Like, especially in yeah, the early days, follow. I feel like I could, I could talk myself into that. Yeah, my conversations with Rob when he joined as co-founder later, kind of after the first version of Salesoft, they were, we're going to put values at the center of everything regardless of what we sell. Like, yeah. we could go into the food manufacturing industry, maybe, I don't, I, I don't know, but we're going to be, we're going to be the way that we run the business. And that was an attitude we had. And when we did cancel the old product, I remember we set up this tombstone and we had like, uh, you know, dust in the wind was playing dust in the wind. and all the employees, all the, all the lofters were glass half full about it. Right. right. Here comes, you just, you know, who took my cheese? We just stripped out a $7 million ARR product. It's no longer there. You know, the way you, the way you sell your software and the way you, you know, generate your revenue for your family, like you got to move to this other product, which is unproven and complicated and, you know, and not, we don't, weren't even selling it for as much and it wasn't selling right. as fast, you know? And uh, <laughs> so I think there were some of those like hurdles and challenges and obstacles that like, if you, if you let yourself get carried away with negativity, you could have, could have been pretty detrimental to the business. Oh, totally. I think that's, I think that's great perspective. And again, I, I love that story of like you killed off uh, and you knew you kind of sunset a very, very, uh, you know, key part of the business in the early, early days to focus on something that you knew was true. An another variation of that, of that question, we, we talk about kind of that zero to five as being really tricky. There is a whole highway of abandoned companies that didn't make the leap from 10 to let's say 50 mm -hmm. in revenue. What we've, what we found in MSP is you can run and gun and hustle your way through friends and family and portfolio companies and VCs to get to around 10 million in run rate. At some point in time, before 50, you got to kind of turn into a real company. I, I want to ask you a specific question about that phase. In that, you start to go from teams of one to maybe teams of people. How do you kind of grow that without creating organizational silos? of this is sales is porting at marketing and going, the leads are bad and marketing's pointing at sales and saying, Hey, those folks don't know how to close and customer yeah. success is going like, my goodness, I, I can't service these customers. They're all going to churn. What, what the heck do we do? Yeah. Well, I, I want to address that, but I also want to talk about the kind of the zero to one, zero to 10 and 10 to 50. And I think there's a, a phenomenon here. I, you might be able to get to 10 
without a real market opportunity and without a great mm. product that meets the needs, but you won't get there fast. I don't think. <laughs> yeah. And so if you get, if you get to 10 really quickly, I think it's indication of what that market is and that what that potential is. And so getting to 10 as fast as we did, because I think cadence went 200 K 2.4, 8, 18. Right. And that was annual up, kind of up, you know, past that point. And, um, and, and I think that had to be the market was pulling, right. And you can't just sell, you know, what one of my old country uh, VPs, you can't just sell a pig in a poke. Is what he used to say. Um, I don't know what that means, <laughs> um, but you can't do that in that fast. Be Derek. Yeah, no, that was, this is a previous, um, <laughs> but, uh, Derek's got better ones probably. Um, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But uh, so, so I think that is a little bit of indication there that you got something. And then um, the 10 to 50, the kind of the market and delivery good, but then definitely have to get your systems and organization structure in place. And that takes just incredible leadership. And that takes seasoned leadership that understands how to organize teams, how to hire not just frontline people and um, how to motivate and how to check in with them, how to set, set the right goals and hold teams accountable. Um, and I just got to give credit to our executive leadership team there because they're just so strong. And, you know, I learned something from every single one of our ELT members and a lot of it was on professional management and leadership. And so that's just been, um, you know, it's been a gift for me to be uh, surrounded by folks like Rob Foreman, um, you know, like our uh, CFO, Chad Gold, like Sydney Sloan, who you all know, um, they're just experts and seasoned veterans and they've got wisdom and recall and knowledge and history and what's worked and what hasn't. And they're, and they're all self-aware of where their mistakes and challenges and obstacles, what they screwed up on the past. And, you know, we don't ever kind of sit on our hands and say, you know, that's just who we are. We always just get better and better. And, and, um, and I love them for it. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have been able to structure the team to get to where it has. That's, I think that's sage, sage advice. Um, Kyle, we're, we're almost at time here. I want to ask you one last question before we go to wrap up. A lot of, lot of folks in MSP have that kind of entrepreneurial bug. Maybe they've got a side hustle or they're thinking about it. What advice would you give to someone maybe just getting started or dipping their toe in the water of, of building a business? Well, I don't think you can dip your toe. I think you got to go all in, you know? I think it's <laughs> Darmesh Shaw. He's got a quote and he's like, the odds of a successful venture go up exponentially when you dedicate yourself full-time to it, you know? And so- uh, <laughs> Turns you know, out. My, my friends, if, if you're a friend of mine, especially one that I've had since like high school and you ever, even off the cuff, just mentioned you want to start a company, you're going to get basically berated by me until you do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> and like I got a buddy that my whole life, he just wanted to be in the restaurant business. And, and I swear, I mean, it wasn't like every time we would interact, I'd be like, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. He now owns eight restaurants and he's like super stoked. And, um, and so I just, I love just dive all in and do it. Cause like, I don't know, like they can't, it can't, nothing's going to eat you and you know, you're going to work your way through it and just grind and figure it out and stay dedicated and focused. So that's really the first one. I know that's not like hard, hard hitting Pulitzer prize winning advice there. Um, <laughs> the second one I would say it's kind of along the lines of, I think there's an old, um, I'm blanking his name, Dallas Mavericks, uh, guy, famous uh, Mark, Mark Cuban. Cuban. Yeah. He's got a post. And I think the post is like how to get rich or something like that. And it basically says, and it's not right. what you'd expect. It's basically find something that you love so immensely and just dive into it with everything you've got and never stop trying to solve the problems associated with it. And you'll find yourself rich one day, you know? And I think that's the attitude is like, when we look at, when I look at like tech entrepreneurs or any sort of founders, you just have to be addressing a problem that you could address for the next 20 years yeah, and enjoy your life addressing for the next 20 years. And then you got to, it's got to be a big problem and there's got to be people who want to solve it and it's got to be feasible to solve it, you know, all those things. But like, you have to be dedicated to the problem. Like, I don't feel, I'm nine years in, you know, the grays, you can't really tell, but <laughs> we're there, I promise. And, but I wake up every day loving this profession and recognize and, and wanting to deeply understand the problems and challenges that are holding our customers back from massive revenue success. And, and that just like, I can't manufacture that. It just is inside me and it, it's going to keep me going forever. 
That's, I think that's phenomenal advice for us to wrap on. Before, before we wrap, Kyle, I want to give you a chance. I know you've got this awesome uh, virtual summit coming up. And th mm. actually, it's this month. My goodness, it's October. Next week. Mark Roberge, Mark Roberge will be there and a few others. Kyle, do you want to just say a few words about this and uh, give a little plug? Yeah, you know, what they don't have on here is my session, of course. They didn't put me oh, on. But I went on. <laughs> You, you know, know anybody that works at Sales Loft? Let's get that changed. You know, I'm second rate. <laughs> uh, but they, I went out and interviewed uh, some of the greatest CROs in um, in our market right now. You know, with mm. these publicly traded monsters with big multiples, and and I asked them a handful of questions around the new world, around digital sales, around investments they're making, and I'm excited to share those. And these speakers are are just hands down awesome. I mean, Rudnitsky is the king of enterprise sales. Yeah. You know, Trish. Everyone knows Trish and her SDR uh, just wizardry and Susan St. Ledger, um, just a storied career in enterprise leadership and um, Ralph, of course, Mary, I mean, awesome people. I'm just really excited to, to share what we're learning and uh, share it with our audience and bring people together. I think, you know, what's most important in these things, not that sales off shows up and just talks, it's that you have a place where you can meet with other practitioners that are working on the same problems you are and where you can hear great customers talk about what they're doing. So that's what we're doing. Sounds familiar. So it's going to be, Useful. it's going to be a, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun one. The team from MSP will be there. Um, Kyle Porter, founder, CEO at Sales Loft. I know you're incredibly busy. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day on this wonderful Monday to share your perspective and share your story with the modern sales pros audience. Um, on behalf of Nora, the 20,000 members in the community, the folks here live, I want to thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. I love MSP and I've had the opportunity to be at a number of events and I just get so much energy from the members of the group and uh, so excited to be here with you today and, and, and love what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thanks for sharing your perspective. Stay safe, everyone, Kyle included. And uh, the recording for this will be available probably about 24 hours from now when Zoom says it's ready. Um, but with that, Kyle Porter, CEO and founder at Sales Loft, thank you again. And to everybody in uh, online still, stay safe and we'll talk soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. See ya.